when I was selecting the songs for today, I did not know uh, why I was selecting those songs. Usually by Thursday afternoon, um, uh, I s select the songs and the bulletin is ready. And I was praying all the time and said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And God was preparing me for some particular topic. And you all know, uh, the way I uh, do is, I don't uh, look at the Sunday school book. Uh, you know that I don't discount it. I respect um, the word of God even there. But I don't uh, look at it. I just go to prayer and ask God, Lord, please uh, help us. And you see uh, how God has been faithful in all these um, uh, you know, years. That whatever is the, the topic in the Sunday school, even though I don't even look at it, you find the same message that God gives. So this morning, I wanted to uh, share with you the thought that came to my mind was, we are coming close to Good Friday and Easter. So I was thinking about uh, talking about Jesus Christ before He went to the cross. There are certain things that He did, and I wanted to talk about that. So in, in um, that line, I was praying and said, Lord, what do you want us to learn today? And that's when I learned about uh, what Jesus said. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Uh, you find this uh, instance written in Matthew and Mark also. In Matthew chapter 26, you find the same story again. In Mark chapter 14, you find this story again. So, now you know that Jesus was uh, found praying this night before he was betrayed by Judas. Now, the verse 36 says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. Why was Jesus always going to the Mount of Olives? He used to have a permanent place. See, in John chapter 8, you find verse 53 that says, Then each went to his own home. Everyone went to their own home. John, John chapter 8 verse 1 says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 21 verse 37 says, Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. Olives. So Jesus always used to go and spend time. He used to spend time on a hill called Mount of Olives. And he spent time there and then he found his disciples there. And what did he tell the disciples? He says, on reaching the place, he said what? Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Now, uh, we have heard a lot many messages on prayer. I mean, we could do a big series on prayer for five weeks. Okay? But let's talk about what Jesus is telling us today. He says, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, what does temptation do? What does temptation do? To get the answer for what temptation can do, we have to go to book of James, epistle to James in chapter 1 chapter 1, you find what temptation can do. Verse 13 through 15. 13 through 15. This is what it says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. 
If you remember in um, uh, last class in the Bible walk, we said God always tests His people, but is the enemy, Satan, always who will tempt. The reason he tempts is to pull you down. So that when you fail, you lose the blessings from God. Now, the temptation is a very dangerous thing. Now, is being tempted good or bad? Neither. Being tempted is neither good nor bad. But the way we react to the temptation will tell us whether we would walk according to the spirit or walk according to the flesh. So what happens here is verse 14 says, But each one is tempted by his own evil desire. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin when it is full grown, give birth to death. Did you see? It says, it all begins with what? It all begins with temptation. Once you yield to the temptation, then the downfall starts. But what is Jesus telling his disciples here? He says, hey, I want to give you a talisman. I want to give you a good thought. What is that? You don't even have to go close to that temptation. You can even avoid that temptation. Are you getting the point? How do you avoid the temptation? How do you avoid the temptation? He said, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Because once you fall into temptation, now it is up to you how you handle the situation. Are you getting the point? Once you fall into temptation, you may overcome the temptation and or you may or even yield to the temptation. So if you yield to the temptation, you are on the downfall. So Jesus says, I will give you one good idea. What is that? Don't even go close to the temptation. How do I do that, Lord? Jesus said, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. In this episode, in this instant, you find Jesus telling them twice. He went and prayed and then after he came back from prayer, when he was so anxious and so earnest for prayer, his sweat turned into blood. He came back and saw his disciples doing what? They are still asleep. They were asleep. And then what did he say? Hey, get up. Pray so that you don't fall into temptation. So what is Jesus trying to provide us? He is trying to provide us a way that we can be very very far even from the potential of being tempted. Are you getting the point? So Jesus is trying to give us a, 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 a scope a facility, a provision so that you don't even go close to that temptation. Being tempted is never wrong. Please remember that. Being tempted is never wrong. How do you say that? What happened to Jesus Christ after he fasted? 40 days and nights. What happened? He was tempted. He was tempted. Let me tell you something. When you are tempted, that could also be a very good chance for you to glorify God. You are tempted and then you, when you overcome that temptation, that gives glory to God. What happened, what happened to Jesus Christ he was, when he was tempted? He said, man does not live by bread alone. Then he said, you cannot uh, expect God to worship you. You will not go, you are not going to ask God to worship you. God, it's, it is written, you shall worship the Lord. And Satan kept tempting Jesus in several different ways. And Jesus said, it is written. He said, it is also written. He went to the scripture again and again and again. And what happened? Ultimately the enemy had to run away. Run away. When Peter was, uh, Peter said to Jesus, You are not going to die. You are not going to the cross. What did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. He was trying to take uh, charge of you. He was trying to save you like wheat. But I prayed for you. So what Jesus is trying to say is power, prayer is a very essential part of a Christian life. Please remember one thing. Whether you are a believer, newborn believer or the most powerful, experienced, senior most believer in the world or in your church you still need to pray. Look at how a, a sinner makes a contact with God. 
How can sinner make a contact with God? It is only through prayer. When he makes a prayer of confession, right? It may not be a very refined prayer. It may not be with the uh, language, with the flowery uh, vocabulary that people uh, sp- uh, you know, uh, pray. It can be simple words. It can be simple words. But ultimately what is that? It is prayer. What did that sinner, what, what did the tax collector pray that day? Lord, forgive me, a sinner. I cannot even lift my eyes to the heavens. Forgive me, I am a sinner. That is all. What did Jesus say? He went home justified. So the first contact for anybody with God is prayer. And that doesn't stop at one instance. It continues throughout a person's life. It continues throughout a person's life. Jesus is a, the, one of the best examples that you can find for the prayer. Let me tell you something. Whenever Jesus was about to do something very big or after he did something big, you know what he did? He always went into a recluse and prayed. Now if you look at the parable, uh, the, the, no, not the parable, the miracle, miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, you read it anywhere in the scripture, you find after he fed the 5,000, you know what he did? Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And verse 23. From 15 to 21, you find he did this miracle of feeding the 5,000. Okay? You find this in all the Gospels. Feeding of the 5,000 is an interesting uh, uh, miracle which is found in all the Gospels. Look at verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went upon a mountainside by himself to pray. He went by himself to pray. When was this? After he fed the 5,000. Let me tell you something. After, humanly speaking, if you were the one who did a great miracle and you fed 5,000 people, would you really go into a recluse and then a solitary place? Man, you will be on a, you will call the media with the cameras and say, hey, come on, you ask me questions, I'm going to answer you. Ask this guy, you know how many, ask him how many baskets he picked up. Look at this man. I was, I mean, I, he, uh, he was the one who was distributing. I broke it. And you see all these people, look at them, ask them, go and interview them. Right? What did Jesus do? He did nothing like that. He just went into a solitary place. He went and prayed unto his God. See, the, when Jesus himself prayed, what excuse do we have not to pray? Hebrews says, Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, though there is so big a cloud of witnesses, what do we do? We f- run our race looking unto Jesus. So, so he's the best example. He's the best example. So the best example did what? He prayed to God. Now you must say, Chandra, are we not praying? Are we not praying? Then why are you telling us to pray? I'll tell you one thing. You will never outgrow the need to pray. You will never outgrow the need to pray. Show me any believer in the world who can say, I think I prayed enough and that's enough. Can you show that? No. You will never outgrow the need to pray. You know why? Because let me tell you something. What I think of prayer. Prayer to me is a great communication by which I am charged. I charge my batteries when I talk to my God. Because that's when the cleansing takes place. That's when the refinement takes place. That's when the vision is given. That is when the leadership is decided. That is, you know what? When Jesus was about to choose his disciples, when he was about to choose his disciples, you know what he did? You know what he did? Let's look at Luke. This will be interesting. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose the twelve of them whom he also designated apostles. Can you see that? Jesus, before he chose his disciples, what did he do? 
he he chose his disciples after one whole night of prayer of course apart from the one guy you know you know what happened to these 11 people what kind of dynamites they became for god it's all because the prayer it all initiated with the prayer of jesus christ he prayed and chose his 12 disciples he prayed and chose his leadership team can you see think about that what a great example that you find there jesus is showing examples after examples luke 5:16 says jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed and prayed there are several people who are running after popularity we want to become popular so what we do is in the church we try to do a lot of activities we try to do a lot of activities we think oh wow i'm doing this activity because of this activity i'm being appreciated see there are two uh, big illusions that people uh, believers live in number one is by doing a lot of activity you think you're spiritual second thing is by uh, being accepted by the community or by the people around you you feel you are spiritual are you getting it if you do more activity you think you are spiritual the other way is if if you are if you have more acceptance if there's a big crowd following you you say wow i'm spiritual yeah there's nothing wrong look at what jesus did look at what jesus mark 1 mark 135 Mark one thirty five. Let me let me read from thirty two thirty two. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove up drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed so he withdrew to a solitary place and he prayed so look at what happened simon and his companions went to look for him and when they found him they exclaimed everyone is looking for you now let me ask you something when everybody is looking for you would you withdraw to a lonely place Jesus knew that he had to he had to go back and talk to his god talk to his dad he had to commune with his dad my dear brothers and sisters prayer is such an essential part of our life has to be an essential part of life because with prayer you get charged with prayer you communicate with your dad let me ask you something the person who you like the most all right You say I like such a person very much. And what would be your next question? Uh, how often do you talk to that person? Uh yeah, once a week, you know. Really? Then I don't think that's right. If you say you like a person very much, what do you do? You will keep talking to that person. Yes or no? So when you say I love Jesus, why are we not talking to him? Why are we not talking to him enough? The other thing is we don't even listen. That, that that's another problem in the prayer. We don't listen to God. We don't listen. Just think if if you found somebody where the other guy does, doesn't even listen to you. He'll just tell what he wants to tell and go away. Would you like to be around such a person? he doesn't listen to you but you just want him to speak something and go away no we we want to be heard we want to be heard i went to a place and then i was talking to this group of men i gave them 45 minutes to talk after i spoke i i shared the word of god and then i gave them 45 minutes to talk Believe me I didn't say a word I didn't even say yes no nothing no I just kept quiet for 45 minutes you know what happened at the end of it they were all so desperate and said pastor I mean we've been talking all this time so would you tell us now would you tell us your perspective would you please tell us you know when i gave them time to speak and heard they said 
I think we need some better solution. So please you speak to us. God taught me a great lesson that day. That we need to be in communion with God. We need to talk to God. There are so many people in the scripture who have really done wonderful things through prayer. We all know this. We all know this. We look at a few, a few of them. Okay. I want to show you one man who risked his life for the thing that he loved the most. What would make you mad? Something, for example. What would make you mad? See, if somebody touches the most important thing that you have, you will certainly get mad. Yes or no? Say, let's say you bought a... Uh, have you seen people who, uh, when they, when they uh, buy a new vehicle? I've seen that. I mean, I've seen that when they buy a new vehicle, they don't even allow water in the car. I was driving with a friend and said, that friend said, I said, let's buy, let's take a drive through and then let's go and take a, 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 and eat. You know, we don't have time. So that friend said, no, not in my new car. We'll just rather get off and sit there and eat. You're not bringing through food into my car. You know why? Because I love it so much. I spend so much money on this. You are not eating any food in my car. So if you dropped anything or you threw some trash on that, you would get mad at that. Is it not? Because he said, I love it so much. So you don't want anybody to mess with what you love the most. Yes or no? There was somebody who risked his life. And we would say, if he was in our congregation today, we would call him fool of the first order. We would say, man, you are I mean, you're crazy. You're not, I mean, there is another way to do that. The king gave a proclamation that nobody should pray to any god. Look at this, book of Daniel. Book of Daniel and chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... He didn't feign ignorance. He knew what the law was. Now the law decided what? What is the law? Verse 7. It says, The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. We all know the story. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. For what was he thrown into the lion's den? Can you think about that? Because he prayed during those 30 days. As usual, Bible says. Look at verse uh, 10. Three times, see, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened to a Jerusalem Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So yesterday, until yesterday, that law didn't came, come into existence. But today the law came into existence. The law said, can you, can you imagine? You know what people would say? You know what people would say? Let's say today we have a law that you cannot pray to God. You know what people would say? There will, there will be some people who would say, don't you know that the Bible says you need to obey your authority? There will be some people who would say, yes, by even not praying we are obeying the authority. We are, we, are, we, are, we are obeying God. But here was a man who said, I don't care if the law is against God, I am not going to obey it. I want to, I want to just... Give you, a, give you an illustration. Daniel is now thrown into the lion's den. This matter came into the news. People heard it on the television, say for example, those days there was the television, and people heard it. What would be the conversation at the dinner tables about Daniel? People would say, he is stupid, he is, he is crazy. Couldn't he have waited 30 days? See, he is in the lion's den today. He's gone. Do you think the lions will keep quiet and let him be alone? 
He is dead. Daniel is a history now. For what? Because he prayed during these 30 days. The law said, what we people do is they would highlight the law. And here is a man who said, I don't care. I will pray unto my God. He prayed to his God. He was thrown in the lion's den. He was thrown in the lion's den. What did God do? But God honored Daniel's commitment. He sent an angel and did what? He shut the mouths of the lions. A great night for Daniel. <laughs> Is it not? It's an amazing night for Daniel. He'll never forget it. That, that particular night till he died probably. Maybe if Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were there, he would always talk to them and say, Man, I tell you, I was all this time around these lions and I should have seen my situation there. But you know what? God shut these lines. What happened? You know, because of that great commitment, Greg, that great commitment, look at what the king did. The same king who issued an order. You know what he did? He issued another decree. Verse 26. Daniel 6, 26. 25, 26. The, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs the signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Who is writing this? The king. What happened? My dear brothers and sisters. The law of the land changed. You see that? The law of the land changed. Because one man stood for his commitment to pray. He stood for his commitment to pray. I want you to understand what God can do through prayer. Somebody said, I don't know why God would not answer except any other way than through prayer. Why? I don't know. But God would not answer except anything through prayer. Have you heard about a man called David Livingston? David Livingston was a great, a great uh, explorer. He went to Africa and he did a ministry there among all these tribals. He loved the Lord so much. People, he, he felt sick. And when he felt sick, you know, the, what the people did was they wanted to kill him. The way they did was his medicines were coming from England they stole his medicines he did ministry in those tribal places one day he was so tired he told his tribal groups by the time there were a lot, lot many Christians around him many people accepted the Lord he went into the room of the tribal chief and said hey let me go and pray he went and sat by the bedside, knelt down and he started praying. He prayed and prayed and prayed. And the headman and his two associates, Chima and Susi, these two men, they were waiting outside to see this man finish his prayer and come out. He's not coming out. They said, man, he's, this prayer is going too long. And they got suspicious. They went in and saw shook this man and he was dead he died in the kneeling position he walked into heaven while talking to Jesus what a, what a great privilege that is this man dies on a kneeling position and after he died The queen said, send the body. And the African said, no. And ultimately they yielded. You know what they did? They cut out his heart. 
and put a label on his body. They took the heart and buried it in Africa and said his heart belonged to Africa. He said they sent the body with two of his associates carrying the dead body of David Livingston 1000 miles on foot in the forests. Two men close to traveling three months all the way to the shore and handed over the dead body to them. Man who died on the kneeling position. My dear brothers and sisters, the result of his ministry is seen in Tanganyika and Zanzibar today. That's called Tanzania, Uganda, in other parts of Africa. You go to an African and ask him about David Livingston, he'll tell you his story. Man who died on the kneeling position. Wow, what a great, great privilege that is. You can achieve so many things in your prayer life. You, may, you can achieve so many things. When Hezekiah was on his deathbed and he was about to die, God sent Isaiah the prophet. What did Hezekiah do? He turned to the wall and he did what? He prayed. He turned to the wall and he prayed. Today we, we read in Psalm chapter 86. In Psalm chapter 86, I like this verse very much. That said, David said here, he said, verse 7, In the day of my trouble, I will call you, I will call to you, for you will answer me. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you and you will answer me. This is a kind of God we have. This is a kind of God we have who will answer our prayers. Second Chronicles 7.19 A very popular verse that we all know. What is that? If my people who are called by my name what should, we, what should they do? Did you, did you read that? Did you read that? If my people who are called by my name Yeah. Will do what? Seven nineteen. Let me read that. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So you cannot remove prayer from a believer's life. You cannot be remove prayer from a believer's life. And let me tell you something. What is prayer? What is prayer? You know prayer is also what? A weapon. Prayer is a weapon. How do you know that? In Ephesians chapter 6, when, Jesus, when Paul was talking about the uh, whole armor of a believer what did he include he included what prayer he included prayer because we are not fighting with what flesh and blood 612 Ephesians 612 for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the power of uh, this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms in Mark chapter 9, when the disciples were not able to perform the miracles, and when Jesus was asked, like, why, are they, why is it that you are able to do that and your disciples are not able to do that? What did Jesus say? Such thing can come only through prayer. This kind, verse 29, this kind can come only by prayer. It's only by prayer you can perform miracles. It's only by prayer the pe people can be healed. So prayer is such an important thing in our life. So we need to remember that. I want to close with three examples in the scripture about prayer. When you talk about prayer, you will get three different kinds of answers. Okay? You will get three different kinds of answers. The first kind of answer you could get is a delayed answer. Okay? It's a delayed answer. Look at Abraham. 
When God gave the promise to Abraham, how long did it take for him? How long did it take for him? Okay. Oh, God gave him promise at 75. 25 years. Now let me ask you, if, if Abraham lived in our community, and he always claims that, hey, God gave me a promise. And it took 25 years, 25 years for it to be fulfilled. Would you really believe this man? No. He himself didn't believe till one particular point of time. Let me also show you his son, Isaac. Isaac was given a promise what? Isaac is what? Isaac is a promised son, is it not? Ultimately, God gave Abraham the son Isaac. Now, God also gave a promise that he will be the promised child and through him, there will be several generations that will come. Now, Isaac got married. So what kind of wife should God give him? By the next year, this couple should have a child, is it not? Right? That's what, that would be the logic. That would be how we want it to be. When God said, okay, you are going to, you will be the promised child and through there will be several generations. So immediately what do you think? There has to be a child born after the wedding. Right? Within a year there has to be a child. What happened? If you study Genesis chapter 25 and verse 20, Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padanaram and sister of Laban the Aramean. Verse, 30, uh, verse 26. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to him. He got married at the age of 40. He got, a, got uh, a twins at the age of 60. 20 years. What happened during this 20 years? He thought probably, I'm a promised child. I'll get a child. I'll get a son. God will bless me. You know what? It didn't happen automatically. What happened is verse 21 says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Can you see what God does? He gives a promise to Isaac on one hand and says, uh, Abraham on one hand and says, Hey, you will, be, you will have a promised child Isaac and through him there will be generations who will come. And his wife is what? Barren. His wife is barren. How was it unlocked? It was only through prayer. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. See that? God answered the prayer. Sometimes God gives delayed answers. Sometimes they are delayed. Sometimes they are denial answers. Sometimes they are denial. When Paul said what? Lord take this thorn out of me. How many times did he say that? Three times. What did Jesus, uh, what, what is the answer he got from God? My grace is sufficient for you. Did he get, so did he get an answer? Yeah, what is that? No, you will, you will have this pain. You will have this thorn, uh, Paul. You will have this thorn. So it was a denial. What did Jesus pray? In the same chapter, uh, chapter we studied today. Lord, if it is thy will, take away the cup. Did uh, God take away the cup? No, just think about this. If God had really taken away the cup, now put a projection and see what the history would have been. Man would have still been doomed. Right? He did not. It was a denial answer. Sometimes you get a different answer. Sometimes you get a different answer. In 2 Samuel, there is a beautiful story of David praying to God. I call it a, a two second uh, impromptu prayer. And the prayer was in 2 Samuel 15, 23. It says, David prayed to God and said, O Lord, turn the counsel of Ahitophel into foolishness. Ahitophel was a man whose counsel was considered to be very godly. It was as if you consulted God. And this man is now in the enemy camp. He's with Absalom. Ahitophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. And David has done something very nasty to Bathsheba's life. And Ahitophel wants to take revenge now. He is in the enemy camp. And therefore David prays unto the Lord and says, Lord, turn the counsel of Ahitophel into foolishness. 
God answered his prayer. How did he answer? Very different. Very different. What is his prayer? Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Second Samuel chapter 17 uh, verse 23 says, chapter 17 verse 23, 1531 is the prayer of David, 1723 is the answer. You know what Ahithophel did? He realized that his advice was not followed. He went to home, he set right his house, he hanged himself and died. What was the prayer? Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. How was it replied? How was it answered? The enemy is totally gone. It's a totally different answer. St. Augustine was a man who lived a very, very terrible life. He lived a very terrible life. And his mom was always praying and said, Lord, please change my son. Please change my son. She was a very godly woman. She continued praying to God and said, God, please change my son. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. He got a job in another uh, uh, part of the, uh, uh, another state. So he moved from there and this mom was thinking, Lord, when I was praying for my son to uh, uh, change, when while I'm still here, he's so bad. Now he's going out of my sight. How wicked and I mean, how uh, terrible he'll become. You know what God did? After he moved out of this place. After he moved out of this place, God caught him through Ambrose. He caught him through Brother Ambrose. And then he gave his heart to the Lord. He became one of the greatest, greatest followers of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you really don't know what kind of answer God will give you. But he will give you a different answer which will be much more than what you've expected. Ephesians 3, I want to read this and close. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Did you see that? Now to him who is able to immeasurably, to, to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. You know, we might be limited in asking, but we won't be limited in imagining. But what God does is He will give us more than even what we can imagine. And when we pray, Bible says very clearly, go into your closet. Go into your closet. Jesus said these words. Go into your closet. What, do you, what, is, what is that in the closet? <laughs> Do you ever think about that? What's in the closet? Your dirty laundry. Your clothes hanging there. I mean to say, go into a secret place when the nobody knows you. Nobody sees what you're doing. And you are alone there and God will openly, publicly bless you. It is my prayer that we enhance our prayer life. I know, I need to, when I look at my gauge of my spiritual life, I need to know, I, I, I have to confess, I have to tell you that I have to increase my prayer life. And I'm sure God is speaking to you too and says, because you can now never outgrow the need for prayer. So let's continue to pray because that is an example set by Jesus Christ. Let's pray.